This is experience number four in a new experience in the art of living. In this experience, you'll learn one of the truly great thrills of life, the fulfillment of creativity, and how to develop your perfect memory. This experience is a tremendous step towards successful living. Here is Professor Howard Watrous. Trust in thine own untried capacity as thou wouldst trust in God himself. Thy soul is but an emation from the whole. Thou dost not dream what forces lie in thee, vast and unfathomed as the grandest sea. No man can place a limit in thy strength. Such triumphs as no mortal ever dream may yet be thine if thou wilt but believe in thy Creator and thyself. At length some feet shall stand on heights now unattained. Why not thine own? Press on, achieve, achieve. Creativity. A tremendous subject. I want us to be captivated by it tonight. How to visualize creatively. I'd like to go through what I think is the one way to obtain the highest joys that man can know within himself. And I like to think that the one thing that separates us more from the animals and makes us more godlike than any other one characteristic we have is our ability to create. Now I know when I start talking about creativity, some people have a reaction. They think that creation is reserved for God and man can't create. Creativity is a fascinating word. I think one of the reasons it's such a mystery is because we do not really know what it means. And in analyzing the word and all of its implications, I come up with two distinct meanings of creativity. The first is to actually arrange or rearrange something that already exists. We could define this as the art of seeing the invisible. This could be illustrated by an inventor or an artist or a musician or even a housewife rearranging the furniture in a room. It's not making something out of nothing. It's a process of seeing something that no one else has seen. Now, has everybody here tonight worried? In other words, we have all worried, right? What is worry? I'd like for you to visualize a mother whose daughter was supposed to be in by 11 p.m. It's 4 a.m. Has she been creative? negatively. <laughs> Could she have written short stories all night long? In other words, if you have worried, and we all have, then you have created negatively. Now, I'd like for you to know tonight that every human being is created as a creator. The second kind of creation is a little more grown up, a little more matured, and only a few people have ever encountered this type of creation. This creation is the actual bringing into being of something that has never existed before. Since we have two different kinds of creativity, we also have two different processes to create. And I think it's interesting as we go through the different processes that you can watch the very close similarity between the two, and yet they are separate and distinct. First, let's look at creativity of actually bringing into existence something that never existed before. And let's go to our Creator for the actual illustration. When we look at creation in Genesis, we find that the original creation was first brought into being by thinking. The thinking process, or the idea process, was fully vested in God the Father. Now after the thought has been established, the second process 
is the Word. And the Word is actually the position which speaks the Word. And in the original creation, we find this position filled by Christ. In other words, he knew the thought, and since he was in direct line and fulfilled the position, he spoke the word. Now, the speaking of the word we call affirmation. And after affirmation, we have what we call a waiting period. This is a hold on period, the fighting period. In other words, this is where you have spoken a word and you do not back down until the creation appears. Now, when we want to see how does man fit into this type of a creative activity, first of all, he has to know whose position he fills. Does he fulfill the Father or the Son or the Spirit? As we study this, there's only one place he can fulfill, and that is the Word. Now, how do we do this? We have to go to our concept of unity. By unity, man occupies the same position as Christ. We say then that he fills the gap. Now, the missing ingredient in creativity in the world today is the gap or the word. It's almost as if the Father were a main plug, an electric current and the spirit were the light bulb on the end of an extension or the actual creation with only one ingredient missing, a missing extension cord. Now, in the original creation, Christ fulfilled this extension cord. In the present day creating, man, by unity, being Christ, fills the gap. This is the most fascinating thing in the world because if you actually find your position you can create by speaking, by affirming the word, and then by holding on until the actual creation actualizes. Now, let's contrast this with our other type of creation. The other type of creation, we have the same three positions, only we call it idea, work, and actuality. And as we proceed the rest of the evening, we'll be able to distinguish between these two types of creation. There are difficulties with both types of creativity. Let's just outline these at the outset. The first is the divine type of creativity. The difficulty here is the ability to hold on, to fight, when everything is dark and drear, to know that this is really true, and that the creation will appear. The second type of creativity, the human type of creativity, the culprit is the work. In other words, I must finalize the daydream into an actuality by my own efforts. I'd like to go through the five steps tonight of how to be creative. I'd like to reduce the art of creating to its essential steps and make every one of you tonight creators. Step number one will be to actually have something bigger than I am. If I can find something bigger than I am, then I have a unique privilege of being lost in it. That's the first step to creativity. Now, what do I mean by something bigger than me? Well, an illustration could be violets, an orchid, a sunset, Mount Hood, a lake, a mountain stream, a baby deer, 12 puppies. In other words, something that I can look at and lose myself totally in. By the way, I've eliminated fear in the first step because if I'm afraid, will I lose myself? No. You take a man who's afraid and let him go walk in the woods alone and he would like to carry a portable radio along. He wants noise so he won't be alone, so he won't be afraid. Could you lose yourself in the woods in the respect that we're talking about losing tonight? Very much so. Now, 
Another way to describe step one is to call it a magic moment. And it's interesting to know that if you have a magic moment coming up, oh, let's say in the next week, you won't commit suicide tonight. And if you think you'll have one in the next 20 years, you will not commit suicide. But what if you think you're not going to have any more on this earth? You're thrilled. In other words, you, you actually give up everything. Now, when a magic moment is expressed in your life, there's one other thing you can do, too. You can have the joy of remembering it. I know in several older people that I've talked to, they live for the memory of magic moments that they've had in the past, but they know that the ones in the future are becoming less and less and less. Well, you might think the memories are wonderful, but memories can become very sickening if that's all you're going to have. The only reason that memories are important is because they actually reinforce present situations. If a memory did not reinforce a present situation, the memory in itself is worthless. Whereas if I would suddenly move you to another planet, would your memories of this earth be of any value there? No. So what we're describing here is the actual joy of living. And we're going to call this the joy of receiving. If I'm walking down the street and I smell lilac blossoms, I never planted a bush. I don't know where it's growing. I don't pay the wind that brings it to me. Is it free? I am receiving. I'm having a magic moment. Now, might I walk by this certain street again tomorrow with hope? You know, when I get something free one day, I want something free another day. So I keep trying to actually obtain this joy over and over. Now, if you want to examine your life and, and be real honest with yourself, you'll find out that most of your motivational patterns are actually geared on magic moments. Now, you are too sensible, too reasonable, too rational to tell people you're that crazy. <laughs> and whenever you do something, you probably will actually devise at least five good, solid reasons, and I guarantee you one of them will be economical. Can you justify your behavior? But down underneath, only you know what. I bought the car because it was red. And I had a little toy red car when I was a little boy. Isn't this kind of silly? But you don't tell people that, that it was red. It happened to be the only color that they had. That's what you tell them. You say, why did you pick that model? Well, the gas mileage, don't you know? Now, am I getting back to being economical? Now, these magic moments, they have an actual ability to culminate in a real beautiful sensation. I'll describe it for you tonight. And if you've had this sensation, chances are you're, you're getting close to becoming very creative. I'll give you one I have in my own life. I anticipate fall. Because at a certain time in the fall, the temperature's, oh, about 50. And the humidity's about 40%. And the leaves just crunch a right kind of a sound underneath your feet. And then if I can smell burning leaves, that smoke, and if I can see a full moon, and if I can pretend I'm going to a football game, I've got it made. I set off a sensation. Now it goes back in my memory until another time. And then that goes back in my memory to another time. And this keeps going back in my past and pretty soon I've got about, oh, a hundred memories. Maybe clear back when I'm in the first grade and we baked potatoes in burning leaves in the street. Or back to a wiener roast at high school. Now, as these go back, they go back until they go back to, I can't remember anymore how far they're going back. Until they feel like they're going back forever. And then somewhere back there in infinity, it culminates in a climax and in sets reverberations that come back and it touches each memory all the way up to the present again. And by the way, when this touches each memory, it makes this memory more wonderful than it could have ever been in real life. Then as the sensations come up to the present moment, what happens to my magic moment at the present? 
why I'm going to heaven. Now, if you want to get a real beautiful sensation, make sure that your magic chain goes back to childhood. Now, to see how many are with me tonight, how many have had this kind of a sensation? Let me see your hands. Half of you. Well, we're going to have half of you artists before the night's over. This is one of the most important criteria of being a creative person. In other words, it means that you have valued the little things that don't have a price tag. In other words, you haven't been so practical that you've lost all the joy of living. You've been able to walk through the woods and, and see little tiny flowers and little tiny leaves and things that very few people even know exist. By the way, no matter how practical you are, you still live for step one. You might even disguise it in your own life and you might even have to reach step one on a subconscious level because you might be so practical in a conscious level you can't stand this. But basically, this is what we've got to do. I know one particular gentleman was at the beach. Can you visualize? He's walking along, and as he takes one step forward, there's a little pool of water. Oh, it's no more than two inches deep. And as he looks in there, he sees his face, and there's his little son, about seven years old, who looks in the same puddle and sees his face, and then they see each other's face mirrored together. Now, I'll try to describe this. When you try to describe a magic moment, you're trying to do something almost impossible. But now, he had an image of having a pure relationship with his son as being one. Now, for a split moment, when he looks in the puddle, what does he see? There they are. Now, you have to understand that a lot of American men cannot have a relationship with their sons because they have this tremendous fear of homosexuality. Have you ever seen American men hug each other? No, they're scared to death. You have to go over to Italy to find some men. They can express affection for each other, and they know good and well they're still going to be men when they get through. But American men are not quite sure what's going to happen after they hug a man. So therefore, will they? Do they crave a relationship with a son? All right, now, what has he got? He's got the thing in the pool of water, and it's pure. Now, do you know, every time he gets a chance where he goes? To the ocean. What's he want? Well, he'd like to capture this thing again. If he could have this feeling once more, it'd be worth living. In other words, he'll do anything to capture it. By the way, seven years he hasn't captured it. And will he ever? Now, well, I've been giving you illustrations tonight of where we go to step one and try to exhaust step one without the other four steps. In other words, you're trying to have magic moments, but we don't know how to go about having them. Some people ask this question, how many magic moments should I have in a day? And my answer is several thousand. I could ask how many have had one today, but I won't. Or I could also ask how many have had more than two in the last month. By the way, if you've only had one the past year, you're sick. In other words, you need help because we say that your creativeness is drying up. Step two, let's just plain call it reflection or awareness of awareness or taking notice of one's own thoughts. How do you do this? Well, as soon as you're lost in step one, you just stay lost a little while. And pretty soon, you're in step two, and you're in reflection. I was down at Crater Lake two years ago, and the snow was still pretty deep. The tourists hadn't arrived yet, and it was a silent place. And there were some wild birds there, and I just finished feeding them. They had flown away. And I was still looking down into the water. And a few minutes later, I had to almost shake myself because I didn't know where I was, almost didn't know who I was. What had I done? I had become lost, and I had gone into a deep state of reflection until I had become aware of awareness. By the way, if you have fear, can you do this? You will have nothing to do with it. You want to get back where the people are. But let yourself completely go, and you run into step two. Then you come into the step three, which is the result of step two, 
which we say is basically this bad word, impulse. Or I'll put another bad word up here, whim. Or another bad word, idea. In other words, after I've had steps one and two, all at once I want to do something, don't I? Here's a housewife, she's sitting in a chair, listening to a song that was played at her high school prom. Does she have a magic moment? She stays in the chair and she's reflecting. And she's taking notice of her own thoughts. And all at once, she turns around, looks across the room, and she sees the furniture arranged a different way. Can you see now how the process works? Now, we call that an impulse or a whim or an idea. Here's an expression, a whim a day keeps the doctor away. But I'll guarantee you, whims are expensive. What about a lady walking along and deciding, that's the hat for me? If you're a good husband tonight, you always tell her that whenever she has a whim, what should she do? Follow through. In other words, learn to be free. Learn sometimes to become reckless, cancel appointments, and go do something you didn't think you were going to do. In other words, just relax, and then whatever comes out of you will develop. I've heard this expressed, that when you go through step one and enjoy step two, you want to put this feeling you have into form. And that's all creativity is, is expressing myself. Now, step three, is this not something original with me? Does this exist anywhere else in the world? Now, when I follow through on step three, do I express more of my individuality into this world? Then do I become more of a person? Do I have a better self-image and do I respect myself more? All right, step four is work. The housewife who suddenly sees the furniture a different way, she has a choice. She could go to bed. She could talk to the neighbors the rest of the afternoon, or could she go to work for two hours? If she went to work for two hours, would she have something original that had never existed before that she could give her husband when he came home? Step number five is the joy of giving. Contrast the joy of giving with the joy of receiving. Do very few people ever find the joy of giving? You think about it for a moment. No, because they have never gone through step four. Therefore, do they have anything? This is interesting. You cannot give of yourself until you first have something of yourself. We're not talking about giving money. We're not talking about buying something that somebody else has created and giving it either. We're talking about giving what then? Something of you. When he comes home from work and he sees the furniture arranged a different way, has she given him something which is of her? This is completely different than if she bought him a shirt. That's whose creativity? The shirt manufacturer's creativity. In other words, she's just a merchant. She's peddling the shirt from the store to him. And there's no creativity in peddling. Anytime you're in the peddling chain, we call that a routine function. And there's nothing creative. Oh, speaking of shirts, though, she could have made him a shirt. Then we're back to being creative. Let's put some different words here which will help us. Let's call number three bud, number four blossoming, and number five flower. We could call number five creation too. Let's go through it a different way. Let's say number three is idea, number four is work, and number five is actuality. Are you beginning to get the relationship of three, four, and five? In other words, this is when I first think of it, this is when I do whatever I have to do to complete it, and this is the finished product. 
The finished product is always something that I give to somebody else, which gives me my joy. Now, when I go through the cycle from one to five, I end up in the future having more ones. If I stop the cycle at either one, two, or three, the number of ones in my life dries up. If I take this hand and tie it down to the side here and don't move it for six months and assume this is my creation, this is the creative ability that in my body, what can I do if I untie it in six months? Nothing. This is your creative arm here, one through five. What happens if I tie it up and don't go past three for 20 years? Do steps four and five dry up? And when they dry up, what do you suppose happens to your magic moments? They disappear. Now, think for a moment in your own life. Did you have more magic moments as a teenager than you're having now? You don't want to answer these, but I'm giving you something to begin to think. And by the way, when people say the good old days, they're telling you what? I had magic moments then, and now I'm not having any. Does this mean that this process is drying up in your life? If you're creative, should you have more magic moments today than you've ever had before? And tomorrow you have more than you had today. Then do you love life? Do you realize that this is all there is to creativity? These five steps will solve the problem and make you a creative person. There's no trouble with one, two, or three. We do this automatically. Here's the culprit. We're going to call this the seven C's of the culprit. Number one, conviction. Before you move into any creating, you're going to have to carry a conviction. It's going to have to be deep inside of you that any primary capability can be trained into an ability, including creativity. Now, a capability is something inherent given to me at birth by God. Therefore, does every human being in the world tonight have the capability of creating? Absolutely. We were all created to create. Now, the fact that I haven't developed it tonight is not God's fault. It's my fault. But if you develop a conviction tonight that you are creative, and hold it, will it change your whole life? You will have a new self-image that you are a creative person. And if you walk out here tonight with a new self-image that you're creative without any other thing from tonight, you will become creative. What happens when you change your self-image? You begin to live up to what you think you are. Now, can you do a simple thing tonight? Are you creative or are you not creative? You are creative. All right, now from this moment on, will you only see yourself as a creative person who creates when? You're going to create on a continuous basis. In other words, it's the only way you live from now on, you create.